My name is uh, Joe Diaz. Uh, it's actually pronounced Diaz where I live, but everywhere else is Diaz, so whatever you want to call me, that's fine. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, logo design in CorelDRAW X5, um, although a lot of these things will work in, in older versions too. Uh, how many of you all out there use CorelDRAW? Alrighty. Um, how many of you would say you kind of have a basic understanding of how to use it? Okay, that's good. Um, just to let you know, this whole thing, we're going to record this whole thing. Uh, I've got screen capture software doing it right now. Uh, my brother Ben over there is uh, recording too. And I'm going to post this online when it's all said and done. Um, so you can take notes if you want to, feel free. But uh, if you'd rather just sit back and relax, uh, all this will be online later. Um, if you do want to take one note, it would be this. Uh, diazmedia.com is where I'm going to post the video. You simply go to the blog <laughs> section and that's where it's going to be. Uh, the other thing you can do is after this is... Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, it's Diaz or Diaz, D-I-A-Z, media.com. And uh, you want to go into the blog section. That's ultimately where it will be once I'm done putting the whole thing together. Um, like I said, I, I kind of enjoy just sitting back and watching someone talk rather than you know jotting down notes the whole time. If you want to jot notes, that's fine. Um, but if you miss something, uh, feel free to ask questions at the end. Um, or you know, feel free to log on and uh, check out the video online. And the other thing is, if you'd like afterwards, see me, uh, and I'll get your contact information, and I could uh, email you and let you know when the video will be posted. Um, so what I want to talk, I, I don't want to just talk about how to use CorelDRAW to do logos, but more of the process that I use. And it may not be the process for everybody, um, but maybe there's a few little things that you can get out of what I do and, and apply it to your, your everyday process. So um, these are kind of thoughts that go through my head every time I do a project like this. Uh, so the first question I ask when a customer comes in is, you know, are we trying to do a logo for this customer? Uh, do they just want to sign? Or are we going to try to do a complete brand for them? And so what's the difference between uh, a brand and a logo? Um, the way I kind of set it up is a logo might just be an image that somebody can use. Um, but a brand is something that we're really wanting to sell. Uh, with a brand, we can sell uh, the logo type. We can uh, sell the color themes that they use on all their promotional material. We can do their signs with a brand. Uh, vehicle graphics, websites, brochures, business cards. Uh, tomorrow, I'll have another seminar at about the same time, I think. Uh, that. In that seminar, we'll be covering all the different things we can do with the logo that we're creating today. So how do we take that logo and turn it into a brand? Now, if a customer comes in and they're just wanting a logo, that's OK. It could eventually turn into a brand. Um, in fact, the majority of the time for us, people either coming in just for a sign or maybe just for a logo. But a lot of times, small businesses aren't thinking you know, big. They're not thinking the whole brand. So our job is to try to sell them on that. Because not only is it good for us, meaning you know, more money, more projects to do, but it's also good for them. You know, they have one cohesive image that they use on all their marketing. The second thing I usually think of right off the bat, and I talk to the customer about this, um, you know, what type of logo are you looking for? And I, I kind of break them up into two different types of designs. You could potentially say there's three. Um, an icon design and then a panel design. Now the third one would be uh, like a logo type, which would be um, just lettering. It wouldn't necessarily have any imagery that, that goes along with it. But uh, this is the logo we'll be talking about today. Um, I thought it was appropriate being that we're in Atlantic City and you know, you've got Caesar down the street there. So uh, it's got kind of that, uh, that Greek theme to it. So, um, I'll be walking you through how to create this whole logo uh, and then tomorrow the brand uh, using CorelDRAW. But when you look at this type of uh, 
icon versus panel. Um, the benefits of an icon design is it can be uh, rearranged in a way that uh, makes it uh, very flexible. So, um, you know, you could have the, the imagery over top of the lettering style, and that would fit a taller, uh, more narrow uh, sign or layout or any type of ad. Um, or you can move the icon to the right or left, and you, you create something that fills in a wider space. So, a lot of times I try to uh, steer, especially if it's a customer that's really going to be using their brand, I try to steer them towards that type of image. Um, now, panel design, uh, the great thing about that is that's a ready-to-go sign. Uh, a lot of times you can take similar elements to the icon design and create a, a, a panel design. Sometimes they're a little more interesting to look at. They're, um, you know, they've got a little bit more going on, but uh, in this case, we've created a design, and that design is uh, works well for not only an icon style logo but also a panel style logo. Um, and the reason why that is is we've created the type style. Uh, we've got a secondary copy, and then we've got the imagery that supports what we're trying to sell. And um, if you can get those three things down. Uh, you can kind of arrange those in a, in a number of different ways. So an ideal logo is a logo that could essentially fall under both of these categories. You know, with a little bit of additional work, you can turn an icon design into a panel design, which makes a great sign. Um, like I said, I was talking about design elements. So for this brand, what I've done is, uh, the first thing I did was uh, I started with the illustration. Now, 99% um, of the time, I shouldn't say that, I should say we were like 80% of the time. That's kind of where I start, and then I go into the lettering style. But every once in a while, I'll start with the lettering style. Um, then I want to uh, focus in on colors, um, what type of colors we're going to be using throughout the theme. And that could be something, um, you know, maybe you just want two colors, maybe you want three colors. This one's a little more complicated to design, so it's going to have. Uh, multiple colors that, that we'll try to reuse on all the branding. Um, and then obviously we created uh, a kind of Greek uh, design motif that would, would also work with the, the overall brand. All right, so now this is, a, this is something that's worked for us. And, I, and I'm not trying to, to sell you on this process. I just know it works for us. Maybe there's something about our process that might work for you. Um, the way I look at our industry is, um, you know, it, we're in the perfect industry to, to also sell logos. It just seems to fit well. And I kind of look at a, a logos and signs like vinegar and oil. You know, they go great together uh, on a sandwich, but uh, naturally they want to separate a little bit. So uh, what I like to do is when a, when a client comes in, um, a lot of times, for us anyway, they're just simply wanting a sign. So then the challenge becomes, well, you know, they came in, they didn't have a logo, they didn't have an image for themselves. How are we going to sell that to them? Um, and, and this is kind of the best way, the best approach that we've come up with over the few years, that, or the however many years we've been in business. Uh, how many of you have designed a sign for a client, um, did all the work for them, and then a week later, a month later, maybe even a year later, they call up, they want that design, and they want to use it as a logo. Raise your hand. Yeah, a lot of you. And I'm sure maybe some of you, are, you don't need to raise your hand or anything like that, but uh, maybe just not or something. I'm sure some of you have uh, just been like, yeah, sure, I'll send you the vector files. Um, some of you maybe charge you know, for that maybe $20, $30. Whatever, I mean, maybe $100. Um, the problem we've run into with that is uh, a lot of times if we don't have a good game plan from the get-go, uh, that creates problems down the road because they, they think once you design the sign for them, uh, they're entitled to that artwork and they should be able to use that for their, their logo. And you, know, you may agree with that, you may disagree with that. I personally disagree with that. I think a logo is different than a sign design. Um, so when a client comes in, I'm going to walk over here. Um, we show them this is kind of our uh, menu board, I guess, so even though we just have it in a booklet and we open it up for them. 
Uh, right now, what I did is I X'd out all the pricing because I don't want this to be about what our prices are. That should be something that you can develop on your own. Um, but this is the concept that we use. When a client comes in, like I said, vendor and what, we've got a separation down the middle. And uh, when a client comes in, they may want to sign and they may want a logo. Um, they may want both. Uh, but a lot of times what we do is we, uh, we break it up this way. So when a client comes in, let's say they just want a parking sign, something simple. A lot of times you don't even need to break this out for that. You just do the job. Chance, you know, you've got a very high chance that they're not going to want their no parking sign for their logo. So, in that case, you know, they may not be interested in, in this first section at all. But as you can see, um, ideally what you want to do is as the, the customer looks this way, the price goes up. Um, this may be a couple different factors. Uh, if you like to uh, price your design uh, by the hour, by the minute, however you do it. Uh, it could be that way. It could be you know, what their client is giving. Uh, for example, when we get over into the logo section, the minimal design might be just a logo, whereas the high end might be the whole entire brand. Uh, so you can kind of divide that up however you want, you know, whether it's how many concepts the customer gets, how many revisions they get, that's up to you. But um, the, the thing I like about this is this shows, using the same information, um, this shows a customer how extra cost will get them more. You want to kind of somehow demonstrate that to them. Uh, so let's say a customer comes in and they simply want to sign. They're not really looking for a logo. The whole point of this is to show them that, okay, if you do that, you aren't getting a logo. If you want it to become a logo, we can, we can do that. You should probably be looking on this side of the page right now. Um, but let's say, you know, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that they do just want a, uh, a sign, and then later on something comes up where they decide, oh, that sign is so great, I've got to use it as a logo. That's fine. What we've done is we've added this sign design to logo conversion package. And essentially what that does is that adds the additional cost that it would be if they would have just went with the logo from the get-go. They might be spending a little bit more by doing it this way. But ultimately, you're getting what you think is fair for logo design. Um, another thing down here, we've got to decide just a quick little blurb about the difference between vector and uh, bitmap or raster, and uh, that's kind of helpful to show the customer right off the bat. Because one of the selling points of a logo is with a logo, you get the artwork and you get it in multiple formats. Um, I, I'm assuming most of you, if you do do global development, that's something you like to do is create a package for them so that they can use the logo. I mean, you're not just going to send them a low resolution bitmap and expect them to effectively use the logo. Um, I don't know about you guys, but for us, if we're going to create a logo for them, we want them to use it. We want them to use it right. And so we create this disk with these different file formats, and one of them includes vector formats. And we do Corel Draw, we do Adobe Illustrator, and then your, your standard EPS. And that information is all on here. And like I said, we'll post this up online so you can actually uh, zoom in and read all this information. Um, but the, the whole point of this is to separate signs from design. Um, I happen to think that that's the way it should be. Uh, down here you can see uh, we've got a replacement disk. Uh, usually that's not a problem. And you know, we had one customer where their building burned down and they lost their disk. And obviously we're not going to charge them for that. But uh, you know, every once in a while you have somebody that they just misplace it and uh, you know decide what that charge may be. Ours is thirty dollars. I think that's that's fair. Uh, email logo art file. And and keep in mind this is all under this section. So they've already purchased the logo. So we're not uh, doing this and then doing $30 to send them the, the artwork. If they haven't bought the logo, this stuff doesn't apply to them at all. Um, so they purchased the logo. Uh, they want the artwork emailed someplace. Even though they already have it on disk, they can do it themselves. That's fine. We can do that for you. It's going to be $30. Um, 
This is something we've tried. It's a limited marketing service, and basically uh, we set a, a, a cost on, on what that would be, and it's an annual cost. And essentially, the customer just calls us and, and says, okay, this artwork needs to be sent to this magazine, or this needs to be sent this way. Can you take care of that for us? Instead of them doing $30 every time, we set a good price for what that would realistically cost to do that all year. Um, and then obviously there's a full identity package, which anymore uh, essentially is our high-end price. Um, now you'll notice also with these pricing there's ranges, so you can kind of give the customer uh, an idea of, you know, it could be this much uh, if all goes well, but it could be even more if we, you know, run into some issues. But that's how we handle it. Um, I'm going to pause right now, and uh, if you have any questions on on that, uh, does, it, does this seem like something that you would use? Uh, yeah, go ahead. How do you handle it when the um, horse is already out of the barn? In other words, you've done that to a sign design and for somebody, and then you know a week or you know, a week, three weeks later, it ends up uh, your sign design your proof ends up in the local newspaper. Yeah, she she asks, how do you handle that once the the artwork is is already you know they they just did the sign and then later on they decided to use a little bit. Um, well, before we did this, uh, we would uh, do the same thing that we're doing now, um, which is we would uh, either send them the bill for that artwork and hopefully they they would pay for that. Otherwise, we would seek legal action. And I don't want to get you know into too much detail on that because I'm not a lawyer and I don't want to get that information, but. Um, but the difference is now between uh, or uh, compared to before we had this is uh, then we didn't have this. We weren't able to talk to them before we actually started on any work. Uh, we didn't explain to them the difference between a logo or a sign. Um, they didn't have a true understanding of it. Uh, to us, it makes sense that we should get paid for our logo if, if they're going to use a sign. As a logo, we should get paid for that. To us, that makes sense. To them, maybe not so much. They should get it, but realistically, sometimes they don't. And if we didn't tell them that, that's kind of our fault. Um, so now that we have this, and unless it's the no parking sign, we break this thing out every single time a new customer comes in. We explain to them, this is what you get for your money. And we found that when, when customers understand what they're getting uh, for what they're paying, they usually go along with it and they're happy with that. Every single customer that I've showed this after we started doing this, they understand it. It makes sense to them. It's not something that they argue with. And if it happened to be a customer that was unhappy with it, well, that's fine. See you later. You know what I mean? It, these are our terms. These are our, um, this is our policy. Um, but uh, I don't know. Did that answer your question? OK. Uh, anyone else? Okay, like I said, this will be posted online, um, and uh, you can kind of read. I know some of the print doesn't show up very good on the projection here, but uh, um, you'll be able to check that out. So now we're going to get to the fun curl draw stuff. That's, that's probably why you're here. All right, so like I said, uh, the first the first thing I start on is the the imagery, and um, there's a couple different ways of, of doing this. You could just if, if you're if you're not a hand drawer, um, you can just kind of jump right into it and, and start creating uh, your vector vector imagery. But a lot of times, what I do is I make a little drawing. Now this is pretty crude, and Truth be known, I draw this extremely small. Uh, I don't know why, it's just something I like to do. I, I just draw very small so everything's kind of tight and condensed. And I think the reason why I do that is because if, it, if it's something I can recognize on a little sheet of paper uh, when, I, when I draw crudely like this, and when I actually uh, turn it into a vector image and I can actually go in and, and fine tune and nitpick on things, uh, it usually ends up becoming a real nice image. So. Uh, the whole idea of this brand is it's going to be a, are any of you familiar with Dave & Buster's? Okay, so it's, it's a restaurant where you can play arcades all day. You get these little cards and you, you get uh, credits put on that and you, you swipe it at the video game and 
uh, and, and you know it's usually a pretty good time. Uh, so this is basically a business that's going to uh, compete with that, but it's going to have kind of a, a Greek theme to it, and the food will be Greek. And um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture that. So what I've done is I've created a uh, a Greek warrior here, and he's got a, a joystick in his in his hand. Um, yeah, so let me zoom in on that a little bit. Like I said, very crude pencil drawing. What I did was I scanned it into Corel uh, to do that. You would go up to File. You would select Acquire Image. Um, you may need to select a source if you have multiple scanners set up. If you've only got one set up or you know one form of, of bringing images in, um, then you simply hit Acquire. Uh, it's going to pull up whatever your scan software is. And once you're done doing that, it will it'll embed it into Corel for you. So that is essentially what I've done here. Um, you know, if you do a real detailed image, you can actually click on the image. Uh, you can go up to where it says Bitmap. And you can go into Image Adjustment Lab. Now from there, you'll actually be able to, you know, adjust your bright, brightness and contrast. That might make it a little bit easier for you to um, work with the illustration once you've pulled it in. Um, so what I've done is I've, I've started with this and then, uh, you know, uh, people may try to look for clip art to do logos, but the, the thing I advise against using clip art on logos is um, when you do that, the customer never really has possession of that imagery. They can't copyright clip art. Um, so if, if you want to create a unique brand form, really it should be unique. You shouldn't be using clip art. Um, it's going to be better for the client in the long run. Uh, so what I do is I, I, you can do this a couple different ways to create uh, simple little illustrations like this. Uh, you can either use a uh, freehand tool. Um, if you select this here, there's the uh, Bezier tool. A lot of uh, people that are familiar with uh, Adobe products might be more comfortable with that. Um, I'm more of a freehand uh, tool guy myself. Uh, the cool thing about this this particular tool is um, if you click once and you pull out and you click again, it creates a straight line. If you click and hold down, it will follow your mouse movement. Now you'll notice that that kind of uh, tried to guess what that shape was and smooth it out as much as possible. Um, the way you adjust those settings is extremely easy. Uh, over here, uh, at the top, you'll see freehand smoothing, and I've got it set to a high number. Now, if it were a low number, let's say like 17, it's going to be a little bit more precise about following my mouse movements. And as you can see when I zoom in, we've got a lot of little jaggedy nodes here. Um, if you use a tablet, uh, you could probably keep your freehand smoothing kind of low so that it precisely follows your... your uh, your movements, um, or you could set it high so that it, it smooths everything that you use out. Um, I, I like to keep it kind of in the high, high end here. So. Um, so what I do with this illustration is uh, I am thinking about basically bringing it over to here. Now, obviously, um, in this case, I've already done the work, so you know I'm at an advantage here. This may take a little bit longer than it would take uh, you know, if you didn't know that, uh, you know what your final image was going to look like, but uh, what we do is we'll zoom into here and we'll use the freehand tool. And what I like to do is I like to rough out my shapes. And by that I mean I just create straight lines here, and I've created that shape here. Um, now what I do is I go up to the shape tool. And from there, I can either select all of this and turn it into curve up here, or what I can do is I can right click on a line segment here, and I've got options like add. I can delete. I can add a node. I can delete a node. I can convert that line to a curve, or if it was a curve, I would be able to convert it to a line. Um, so what I'll do is I'll hit to curve, and we'll pull that out like that. There again to curve. And I, I just like the fact that it's, you know, right-clicking, I can get to where I need to uh, 
really quickly. Um, but if this whole thing is going to be a curve, a lot of times I I skip all the right click stuff and I go right to this. And it basically instead of me right clicking and turning this into a curve, it's already ready to go. And we can click on that and pull it up. Click on this and pull it up. And you can just kind of adjust your nodes as you go. Now let's say we've got this circle here. Um, we could do the same thing for that, or we can take advantage of you know shapes that are already ready to go. So you could take a circle. Uh, you could duplicate that circle, make it a smidge smaller, pull it off to the side here, and uh, use the trim tool. And we've created a little crescent here that we can use. As you, see, as you can see, I went back to the shape tool. Uh, if you prefer shortcuts, you can do F10. And you know, moving, uh, making these curves, moving them around, or moving nodes around is, is very simple. You just simply click on them and drag them around. So that's one way of doing it. Um, let's say you have more of a cartoon that you've developed and you want, uh, you want your lines to be a little bit more consistent. Um, same sort of deal. We can use the freehand tool or the Bezier tool. We can click here, click here, click there. I'm going to turn this into a curve. I'm just going to leave this as a straight line. Um, then what you can do is you can go down to your outline uh, pen tool and uh, if you select this or if you hit F12 you can go into your um, outline pen control panel or properties. Um, now from there you can uh, select different styles of lines uh, or you can give it a nib shape which kind of works out well for cartoons because uh, sometimes you want your your lines to not be so even. You want you know maybe the the right side to be a little bit uh, uh, more bold, and then the left side to be a little bit more narrow. Um, and then uh, you know you could a lot of times I like to select these um, scale with image. Basically means if I were to uh, create a certain uh, outline width here, let's say twelve point, which I think might be a little bit big. Oh, no, that's about right. Um, and if I were to make this bigger, it's going to keep that same width. Now, if I didn't have that selected, as you can see, it's it's not keeping that width. It's, or actually, I should say it is keeping that width, but it's not scaling up with the image. Um, so we'll go back into there real quick. There's another thing I want to show you. Uh, you can then... Uh, round these caps. As you can see it's sort of straight up here. What I'm going to do is round that off and that's what that tool will do. Um, so that's, an, that's another way of uh, uh, doing that. Now right now if I go into wireframe it's still just a line. So an extremely easy way to fix that, to turn this into a shape, would be go to go to uh, I'm sorry, arrange, convert outline to object. And now that creates a shape out of that. So if I go into wireframe, that has now become a shape. I, I think older versions of Corel, what they it'll keep that line in there. Uh, X5, it, it deletes that for you. Um, that was an extra step I used to not like to take. So you have that too. Uh, one more tool to show you here would be this uh, artistic media. You can use this to do that too. Um, it's got a bunch of different types of brush strokes that you can use. Um, this kind of comes into play if you're, um, instead of roughing it out like I did, if you wanted to just uh, click and hold to do your freehand tool. 
I didn't do a very good job there, so I apologize. But uh, you can always come back in and edit that after the fact. But as you can see, it's uh, you know created a very narrow line, and it gets thicker as it goes. Now you can actually select that object and uh, edit those properties after the fact. Um, by selecting that exact same tool that we used to create the line, if you're on that tool, you can actually um, adjust those settings before you draw the line, or while you're still selecting the tool, you can do it after the fact too. Now there's some, you know, kind of fun sprayer effects in there that uh, I don't find much use for, but uh, I've used it once every once in a while. But um, now once you've created this tool, it's gonna it's gonna keep it as this type of line. You can actually go into arrange again and uh, go to uh, break uh, artistic media part, or you can right click and you get the same tool. I think one of the things I really like about Corel is um, or Corel Draw is a lot of these tools are up towards the top here. Um, or when you right click, you can get those same types of tools here. So you can avoid using the toolbar up here quite a bit um, by simply right clicking or accessing the tools that are already available to you. Every time you select a tool, your features are going to either be there or in that right click for you know 99% of the time. Um, so that's something I really like about Corel. So I'm going to uh, convert that to a curb or convert that to a vector shape here. And see there, it kept the line for me, but it also has my vector shape here. Oops. And now if I were to want to go in here and actually edit points of that shape after the fact, I certainly could. So that's just a couple different ways that you could um, create the lines that you need to make a vector illustration. Uh, sometimes you may not be doing a cartoon, so uh, instead of these lines like this, they might be uh, larger shapes. In fact, this design has a little bit of both of that. So as you can see here, um, we've created some lines here, and we've also created some larger shapes here. So to do something similar to that, here again we can use our freehand tool. We could actually pull this out here. Um, could add our curves here. And here again, like I said, the, the tools become available to you when you do certain things. So if I grab my, um, my picker tool here and I select both shapes, uh, now what I have up here is I've got my weld, my trim, my intersect, simplify, um, all of those features right here. Uh, so if I were to hit trim, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't want to do that. You want to hit the shape that you want to trim first. Uh, so we hit that shape first, then we hit this shape, and then we hit trim. And what it did is it basically um, trim that out. We'll hit break apart. Now we can delete those ex excess objects. Um, so that's one way of doing that. Uh, then we can add color to this and, and get this set up. And as you can see, I kind of, as I go, I fine tune this. Um, we've got, uh, here's kind of a, uh, I wanted to show you that um, at one point I wanted to use, I, I needed some sort of photo, photo reference for the hands because I don't know if, if you're like me, um, I need, when it comes to hands, hands are difficult for me. So a lot of times I like to try finding photo references. So in that case, uh, I use hands to kind of help me out with my, uh, my joystick here. Um, but all this is created in vector. And essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to think of the, the light coming from this direction and casting a shadow this way. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways. You can look at photos to kind of see how this might work. or But uh, this kind of creates a multiple color uh, icon that, that we can use for imagery. So um, that's essentially how I've created the, uh, the basic uh, shape of this illustration so far. Uh, any questions on what I went over for that? Okay.
All right, so now uh, I have gotten to the point where I started adding color. Uh, now this isn't the color theme I went with, but I wanted to kind of show you how you can um, actually go through and, and, and select different colors. I'm going to get to the lettering here in a second because um, this is a case where you could actually use a font or you could create your custom font. Um, in this case, I created one, although there are fonts like this that are, that are similar that's out there. In fact, I'm, I'm sure you could probably get a Caesar font that would work fine, but uh, I like to kind of create my own lettering styles whenever I can. Um, but in this case, what, what you can do is, uh, you know, select a few colors that you want. I like to kind of create these boxes over here to kind of come up with my color themes that I want to use throughout the brand. And, uh, you know, uh, we go over here, and right now I've got, I don't use my laptop all the time, so I don't have all my color profiles set up the way I want them. But, uh, you know, you can go into here and uh, select your uniform fills and, and just pick out some kind of colors that you think would work nice. Now, a really cool trick is, let's say we've, get a we've got a brown here, uh, and maybe we want to add a little bit of red to it. Uh, if you hold your control key down and you select red, it's going to add about 10% of red to that color. If I click on it again, there's another 10%. Now let's say I want to add a little bit of blue into that. By holding the control key down, I click on it again, add just a little bit of uh, blue to it. So that's kind of a quick and easy way to kind of mix colors and, and, and get the colors that you want. Um, if you're doing a big brand like this, it might be helpful to use Pantone colors. And if you do that, uh, and if you have Corel Draw X5, and I think um, I think X3 had it. Uh, I'm not sure how far back Pantone colors. Probably pretty far, but uh, you simply go into your Uniform Fill tool, and you go over to where it says Palettes. And um, right now, I've got the Roland Metallic. If you've got a Roland printer, or if you have a certain type of printer. Um, you can get color profiles and load it up in Corel. Corel X5 uh, has these uh, rolling profiles already preloaded. Um, I was actually playing around with the uh, the newer rolling printers that print metallic colors uh, in October, uh, and uh, they were showing me kind of how that works. But um, if we scroll down here, we've got our kind of default RGB. CMYK colors. Um, we've got our Pantones right here. And you can kind of select your colors that way. So, you know, colors are very important to a brand. Uh, if it's a big brand that's, you know, for a larger company, uh, sometimes they may want those Pantone codes so that they can, they can use it throughout the project. That way all their colors are consistent. You know, even if they went to multiple sign shops. Ideally, you want to be the one-stop sign shop or design firm that handles all this stuff for them. Um, but, you know, when it becomes a bigger corporation, sometimes that's difficult to do. So, uh, you know, it's all about thinking ahead. And, and you know, if, if you anticipate them using Pantone colors, that's a nice way to go. If you know you're going to do a lot of the, the uh, colors yourself, maybe you want to use your, your printer's color profiles, which we use our rolling profiles a lot. Um, CMYK, obviously if you're designing CMYK for print, that's that's nice to do too. Uh, Corel X5, in my opinion, has made huge improvements on the way that the color profiles work and uh, exporting colors to uh, for print and, and things like that. So um, I won't get into too much of that because that could be a class in itself, the color profiling, and, and really that that is uh, not my area of expertise. So. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to um, the lettering here, uh, and the way you could do this. Now, this is like I said, this is an easy one. You could easily just grab a font to do this, but uh, sometimes it's kind of fun to create a custom font. It's actually better for the customer that way because you know they've got something unique, something that's you know, separate from everything else. Um, a lot of the really nice brands out there have uh, custom created uh, type styles. But this is really easy. This is, uh, if you look at this type of lettering, um, the whole idea behind this is it's Greek lettering when they, they chiseled this out of stone. So all the lines are straight. Um, I actually added a bevel here, and I, I'll show you real quick how to do that. It's, it's a pretty, uh, pretty, pretty easy process. Um, but to do that, so what I do is I start with the, uh, 
I'll start with kind of a basic aerial font. I kind of all this is essentially doing is uh, giving me a guide for for creating my own lettering. And if it was a serif font, maybe you might want to start with Times, or you know, if you wanted something a little more condensed, you could you could try out different fonts. But for, in this case, I'm just wanting to uh, rough out this Greek style chiseled letter. And so here again, I'm just using the shape tool, and I am creating a, a width that I want to reuse on all these because chances are back in the day they didn't switch chisels as they went. They wanted to keep a consistent width on that lettering style, so we want to try to replicate that. And so I've created a uh, square here that I will just reuse over and over again. And you can duplicate this and you can flip it. Actually, in this case, we'll start with this again. Now, if you hold the control key down when you're rotating things, um, what it's going to do is it's going to uh, rotate about 15 uh, degrees each time. See how it kind of clicks? I'm essentially just holding the control key. You want to actually put in a precise me precise measurement. You can go up here and type it in. That does the same thing. So So now we can pull this off to the side here. We might want to take these two and, and have them be, um, align them towards the bottom. There we go. Now, uh, uh, you know, the, the C, you could do a number of different ways. You could either have it um, essentially be a, a diamond shape. You could do a, a C like that, or you could just remove those all together and, and kind of keep it this way, which I think kind of is a little more, uh, makes a little bit more sense for this type of brand here. But when it's all said and done, you've created a pretty simple type of, of, of font. Now, if you're wanting to do, uh, you know, more creative fonts, you could, uh, um, you could uh, do them this way here too, and, and it's all about kind of uh, reusing your your similar widths. So in this case, I'm going to create a uh, an E. Now, how many are, are you familiar with the the uh, snap to points in Corel. Do you have that turned on normally? Okay, well, uh, just kind of a quick um, overview on how that works is uh, you can s snap things to object. Uh, you can actually go into view and select it here, or I like to do Alt-C. It's pretty quick and easy. And the, and the nice thing about that is, let's say I want this shape here to snap to the midpoint of that. Um, with that on, once I get kind of in the ballpark, it automatically snaps there, and it, it lets me know that that's what I'm doing. Um, with it off, it's not snapping to anything. And sometimes you might not want that turned on. For the most part, I have it almost always on unless there's some reason I, I, I don't want it snapping. So 
So we turn that on. Uh, and so the reason why I did that is now by duplicating this shape and moving it down here and snapping it to the same point, I've essentially created, you know, a mirror image. And uh, you can weld those together, weld this together. Uh, I want to make sure these are aligned properly, so I'll align them to the left. Here again, I got my snap shape on. I'm going to click here and snap it to the, the edge of this line here so that I can get that exact same width. And you might want to snap it there. And so we've created a pretty simple E here. So you can easily create fonts this way. Uh, I just think it's a nice way to kind of set you apart from your competition. If you're wanting to create really high quality logos that are, you know, unique, that, you know, you, the competition in the sign industry or the design industry isn't doing, um, it kind of just, it adds that extra um, uniqueness to their brand. Now, I promised I'd show you the, uh, the chisel part and how you can do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to duplicate this here. So this is what we started with. And this could be about any color. To create a chisel, um, it's kind of a... Ideally, I'd love it if there was a vector chisel in Corel. Right now, there just doesn't, there just isn't one. Um, but if you go up to uh, Windows, and then Dockers, there's all sorts of really cool, useful tools in this, uh, this Dockers here. So what I'm going to do is, uh, you'll see the bevel. I already have it selected. It's actually already over here. But uh, that's how you turn it on. And your Dockers will show up over here. So I say that, and then I can't find my bevel. Here, let's see if I... There it is, okay. Now you can do a couple different styles, but for the most part, I'm going to show you the soft edge here. Uh, if you select to center, uh, what that's essentially going to do, you could, you could have the bevel not go to the center. I'll show you what that does to here. So let's make it a bigger measurement. Essentially, it's creating this this bevel shape here. Now the problem with this is this is a bitmap. Um, if you're simply going to print this, then you're all set. You're all ready to go. You can change the colors and it will actually do it on the fly. And you can uh, change the way that the direction of the lighting or even the color of the lighting. And the intensity of that lighting. And like I said, the direction of the lighting. So that can all be changed. Um, but for this purpose, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the center. The lighting doesn't really matter um, because it's going to be vector, and I can actually go in and change those colors later. I'll hit Apply. And there you go. Now, this doesn't look very pretty. It's, it's, it's trying to basically figure out what's going here and it's it's you know it's the computer trying to think um, and, and you know it doesn't it doesn't really kind of understand what exactly what you're trying to accomplish so but this gives us a really nice guide um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to break this bitmap apart and uh, as you can see the vector's still back here then I'm gonna use my freehand tool again and with the, the snap to objects turned on, I'm going to create a line that is the exact same angle of this line here. Now what I can do is by uh, making it larger, I can move it over here. Here again with the snap to objects or Alt-Z uh, turned on, I'm going to snap it to the middle point here. And essentially what I'm doing now is I'm creating guidelines to create our own chisel or bevel. Now right here, you might want to go here to here. 
And here this is all kind of just using uh, basic uh, geometry. I'm going to find the center of that line. If you hold the control key down when you're uh, creating a line, as you can see, it does that same 15 degree um, increments. So you can do that. So what we've done here is we've created a pretty decent guide. Uh, now what we can do is actually create the vector parts of the bevel. So I want to complete this image or to complete this shape. And as you can see, every time I make a line, when I bring my cursor back over there, there'll be a, an arrow. That essentially means that you know you're ready to uh, connect your next line to that line. So if you complete a shape, you can add fill to it. If you don't complete a shape, no fill. Now, let's say you've created this real complex shape and it looks like it's all closed, but for whatever reason you can't add fill. Um, that may have, that's happened to me several different times. Uh, if you go up to your shape tool, uh, you select all your nodes here. Um, there's going to be this close curve tool. Uh, you simply click or uh, click on that, and it's going to close that curve the best way that it can. And when I say the best way that it can, let's say. We've got a shape like this. Now we've got two open curves. I'm going to combine that. Now see, who would have thought that it would have connected this way? So a lot of times uh, you can, um, you know, basically close those yourself by selecting the node that you want, bringing it over to the, the closest node, and then it will complete it that way. And now we can complete this way, or we can go like that. So there we go. We've uh, we've created a pretty basic shape. Now in this case, I could do this again, or I can simply duplicate it. And here again, snap it to the point there. And like that. Now, Corel's got some pretty powerful trace features, uh, but they're not very precise, and uh, they would struggle with something like this. So sometimes it's just uh, easier to just kind of get your hands dirty and get in there and, and uh, do it yourself. Now here we want to do the same thing here. Now we can actually, we don't really need this line here anymore, so we can delete that. Here's a cool trick. Uh, to select shapes in Corel, um, if you simply uh, draw a box all completely around that shape, you'll select it. Uh, let's say you want to select multiple shapes. If you hold your um, Alt key down, everything that the box touches then becomes what is selected. Um, I remember using AutoCAD years ago, and uh, the the cool thing about AutoCAD was when you when you clicked down and you dragged from uh, left to right, uh, you would select everything within the box. When you do it the opposite way, you would select uh, everything that the box touches. But in this case, it works the same way. You just simply have to hold Alt if you want everything the box selects. Or if you want to select everything within it, just do it normally without holding down any keys. Now in this case, if we were to create this point like that, that doesn't really look consistent with what's going on down here. So what I like to do is kind of split the difference. Then uh, 
the shape that I created here would now need to do this instead. So we can start adding color now. Um, in, in, in my case, what I did is I, I basically just did a two color design. And uh, so if, you, if you're doing it that way, you know, you can kind of think in advance instead of uh, creating these two shapes like this, uh, we could have done one shape, um, you know, thinking about the light coming from this direction, you wouldn't really need to uh, need to create two shapes because that light would be hitting it in the same way. So that could be your light. This could be your your dark side. That would be light. Uh, this would be dark. Light. Dark. And then you can actually take these and weld those together. Or take this and weld this together. Um, but that is how I do uh, bevels. Now like I said, if, if it's just for print purposes, you don't really need to do that. You just simply use the bevel tool and if you like the results that you get, you're good to go. If you want to actually turn it into something vector, have control over the colors a little bit uh, better, you know, actually be able to assign Pantone colors to those, um, this is the way I like to do it. Yeah, so that's a vector trace. Um, so I'll pull that over here. Basically, the the trace bitmap feature. Um, in the, in this case, what you could do to kind of help you along the way with that is make this a lot larger. That way, when we convert it into a bitmap, it's going to be a, a higher resolution bitmap. But uh, so we'll go to create center apply. And then uh, break apart. And now, as you can see, that bitmap's in a little bit better uh, quality than the one we've created. Um, but then, if you go up to trace bitmap, um, you can do uh, I like to do the um, uh, outline trace. And then, depending on which one of you selects, it essentially is it, it's giving you a, a set of presets for the, the trace program. But uh, if you kind of do a detailed logo is, is one I like to do. And if you crank up the detail, uh, it's going to try to uh, trace it the best it can do. But what it'll end up doing is, you know how bitmaps are created of all these little nodes of colors or these little blocks of colors. If you turn the detail all the way up, it's going to try to trace all of that. Um, so you kind of want to keep it high, but not all the way high. And now smoothing the same deal. It, it can over smooth things. It can make, you know, two straight lines into a, a curve. Uh, so sometimes you kind of don't want that all the way up. Um, corner smoothing, same sort of deal. You can kind of overdo that sometimes. But uh, once you're ready with that, you hit OK. And as you can see, it turned it into vector but yeah there's yeah there's some you know weird stuff going on you could attempt to go in there and change all of that um, after the fact you can ungroup these and actually move these shapes around um, the thing I don't like about it is you know ideally I would like this dark color to be the background of the whole lettering style and then the light colors to be sitting on top of the dark color. When you do trace, it doesn't do any of that. It, it, it creates all separate shapes. So, um, you know, 
the this the trace thing is has its place, uh, just not all the time. Um, but that's essentially how how I do my chisel letters. I, I kind of do them by hand. Uh, once you obviously, I'm trying to show you how to do it as I as I go. I go a lot faster when I'm just kind of doing the job. But uh, uh, once you get the hang of it, it's actually pretty quick to kind of to do it that way. And you know, sometimes maybe you don't want to use this as a guide, and you kind of just want to you know. You already know how to do chisels. You've done them before, and you don't really need uh, the help of the guide. So you could. Uh, you know, yeah, he was saying he knows how the corners are kind of curving in like that. Yeah. And there's there's a lot of software that does a little bit better than Corel does as far as that uh, that goes. Um, you know, there's uh, I don't know, I see Dan back there. I'm I'm sure the uh, the the software for your router probably does some nice beveled effects. Oh, okay. So he does it by hand too, but uh, yeah. 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 Well, I read in a couple of magazines and guys are using like the routers and stuff. They're actually taking it out of the machine and then using a hand chisel to fix all the points because it does the same thing. Yeah. When the program they're using a hand chisel to fix it. Or just a few things. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this. It's uh, and I, I'm, I'm almost certain it's probably not a problem that just Corel has. You know, anytime. Yeah. Anytime you've got a computer trying to do something that the human brain can do better. A lot of times, it's easier just to skip that and, and stick with what you know. And uh, you know, like I said, you don't even really need a guide to do this. You can, uh, as long as you create your center guidelines by simply using your Alt Z file or your Alt Z command, doing making good use out of your Corel uh, or your Control key to keep things at 15 degrees if you're going to design things that way. Or if it's an angle that isn't 15 degrees, simply uh, replicating uh, the line that you want to create by um, drawing right next to it. Oh, okay, yeah, and I'll show you some other really cool tools there too. Um, to get to the Dockers, uh, you want to go to Window, and you want to go to Dockers. And there's a lot of cool uh, tools in here. One we use a lot is Bevel. Um, we also use this tool here. And I'll show you what that does. I don't know why it's doing that on my laptop here. There we go. OK. Now, how many times have you, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you guys do vinyl production, obviously, right? Um, if you're like us, a lot of times what we like to do, especially with the real uh, pointed uh, corners, uh, we like to round those off because by rounding those off, we've created a product that's going to last a little, long, a little bit longer. Those sharp points are the first thing to start going on a vinyl job. So um, what you can do is select a node or select the whole shape, and we can hit apply. Oops, that's too big of a measurement. Let's scale that back a little bit. You can see it's kind of giving me a preview of uh, what it's going to do. But let's bring it back to, OK, and we'll hit apply. And you can see it kind of rounded off that stuff for you. Um, now you can do scallops in the same way. Let's, uh, I'm going to undo Control-Z to undo. Uh, I'm going to hit scallop. Oh, saying it's too short to do that. There we go. So that's kind of a cool little feature. We don't use scalps very often, but uh, you know, if you want to create, uh, uh, you know, the border of a sign, that might be a quick way of doing that. A lot of times, I just find it's easier to just take a circle. It's kind of the old school way of doing it snapping it to the points, just reusing that circle over and over again, and then trimming it out. That's another way of doing it. 
But uh, that's a, another great Docker tool that we like to use. Um, let me uh, look at some other ones in here. Now, if you're doing some more complex illustrations and, and dealing more with print, uh, there's some kind of cool lens effects, which uh, let me show you that. You know, by creating one shape, giving it color, and then we can do fisheye. Uh, we can brighten. And you can get kind of similar tools uh, when you use the interactive transparency, which is uh, one of my favorite tools. Now, the problem with some of these tools with the transparencies and, inter and the lens effects and things like that are um, if you're if you're doing all these projects and, and you're you're doing it in Corel and it's not going to really go outside of Corel, you're usually pretty good to go. Uh, if you're going to export this, you know, for somebody to use an Illustrator or you know uh, Flexi or some other software, some of these uh, lens effects and transparency they don't they don't really translate over right. Um, so the only way to really fix that is to flatten this into one bitmap when you're done. Uh, when we print. Uh, to our role in printer, we send EPS files over. Um, a lot of times, some of these effects and gradients and things like that, they just don't seem to translate over. So we'll we'll flatten a bitmap if it's a real complex image. Um, by flattening in a bitmap, you're creating a, a much larger file, obviously, um, but you're avoiding a lot of those uh, issues that happen when you know if there's a conflict of translating this effect into a different program that handles similar effects in a different way. Um, the best results I've ever had with transferring Corel effects to other programs has been exported as a PDF. And to do that, instead of going to File, Export, uh, you do Publish to PDF. Um, within that, I like to keep it on editing. If, if you know, I'm sending somebody a vector image um, I like to keep it at uh, my preset as editing. Um, it's going to keep a lot of my my settings the way I thought it should be, and I just feel like that's sort of the best way to send over your your Corel artwork for non Corel uh, use. But in this case, if you're creating like this Arcadia design that I'm I'm working on here. Um, if it's going to be for a large company, it's going to be used by many different people uh, using different software. I like to keep it all simple vector. Um, like I said, Pantones might be a good way to go because then you're, you're keeping your colors consistent. Um, but uh, when you start adding effects and gradients, uh, that might be where you run into to issues where uh, one sign maker might make it look one way and then one printer, it might turn out a completely different way. Um, you could still get kind of those uh, shaded effects, you know, lights and darks, by just breaking up your vector into into images. So, you know, if you wanted to even uh, create more of a gradient, you could do that. You know, maybe create one more shade of color. Here again, I create a select yellow, and then I hold my. Oops, let me delete this here. Hold my control key down, and we'll add some some darkness to it here. What would have been quicker is if I would have just taken the the color eyedropper tool, select that Pantone color. Now, when I do this. Uh, when I add another color to it, it's no longer a Pantone color. It's it's created a uh, an RGB color. It depends on what color uh, setting you're in. Um, a lot of times I keep my color profiles in RGB, and the reason why is I know printers will say, "Well, you got to you got to do designs in CMYK," and uh, 
if, if we're designing where we're going to print it on our printer, we found that the RGB colors, we can get colors, you know, some real nice bright colors that you can't get in CMYK. So um, we like to design an RGB. And the other reason is uh, we do a lot of web design work. So obviously if you're doing web design work, you're dealing with monitor colors, not print colors. So you want to design an RGB for that too. But like I said, you can kind of create the illusion of gradients and shading and stuff like that by creating uh, vector shapes. Yes? From earlier when you were showing the different aspects of the logo and the back of your Okay. When you were doing the print out of versions, you showed the setup to a customer and come in and present it to them or whatever? Yeah. What type of printer do you print it for? Uh, because a lot of times with monitors, of course, you see one thing and the printer comes out Okay. Uh, his question was if you um, if you're sending or if you're showing a customer a proof of the design, how do you show them the correct colors? Um, a lot of times, what we do is if we print something out on our desktop printer, you know, we explain to the customer that the colors you see on this page are not the colors that that are, they're going to be. If you're looking at the colors on the monitor, these aren't the colors it's going to be. If you want an actual proof of the colors and how they're going to be printed, uh, we can print that out. And you may want to charge them a fee to do that. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, you're doing extra work to show them that. Um, if it's a large client, you might want to do it anyway. If it's a big, huge project where you're doing multiple signs and print work for them. Um, we don't print brochures and business cards in-house. Uh, so the problem becomes, well, how am I going to get my uh, sign prints, the prints that I'm doing in-house for, let's say, vehicle lettering, how am I going to get that to match the business cards and the brochures? In that case, you want to maybe stick to your Pantone colors. That's going to be your best bet. And then, obviously, you can order print proofs from those companies, too. Some they charge you for, some they don't. Um, it's, it's well worth the cost to do it. Uh, if you've got a picky client or if it's a big job like this, you want to make sure that those colors are, are consistent. A lot of times you just want to explain to the customer, look, it's not going to be, you know, we're talking business cards versus signs. They're not going to be exactly the same. Um, so, you know, you just need to... Well, a lot of times, too, when you, you know the, the concepts you're going to be talking about. Yeah. Like, they get it, it's like, well, colors are... Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and that's why uh, when you send out a sketch, and this is something that we do, along with the copyright information at the bottom of our sketch and the watermarks that we put, I mean, we've got to watermark things nowadays. Um, we also have disclaimers about color, too, and uh, that's also a, an easy thing that you can clear up over the phone when they call and they're, they're complaining that, the, you know, uh, what you sent but, uh, yeah, this, this is all the types of discussions you should have with your client as far as, you know, what they're going to get. 95% of your clients probably aren't going to, if you're doing small business work, I should say, are usually going to be okay with your, if you're using your best judgment and you're trying to do the best job possible. I know at our shop, we're way more picky about colors than our clients ever are. So um, that usually works in their advantage. Yes? Can you show us real quick how Oh, okay. Um, the the gentleman here asked, um, how do you do a watermark? Um, the way I've got it set up, I actually create like a, a shape. Um, let me see here. Let's do a, let's do a quick way. So I create this grid like this. Then what I might do is go to my outline effects here. And uh, I'll give it a dash. Then what you can do is, uh, let's say this is your logo. 
Let's say you have a circle for your logo. <laughs> Good luck copywriting that. Yeah, it's not perfect, but just to kind of show you. Um, we'll give these a... We'll make all these white. So now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm taking all these all of our logos here. I'm getting rid of the outline. I'm, create, I'm turning them to white. I'll do the same thing with this here. I'll take all these boxes here. Actually, I'm just going to select everything. Um, now, if you hold down your, uh, if you're going over here to select colors, when you select with your left mouse key, you're doing the fill. If you select your color with your right mouse key, you do the outline. So in this case, I'm going to change the dashed outline to white. We won't see it right now because it's all white. But if I were to put black behind here, now to, to move something to the back, a quick, easy way to do it is hold down uh, shift and then select page down and I'll send it to the back. Now what we're going to do is we're going to group all this together. Uh, you can do control G to group. Um, we're going to go over to this transparency tool. Now here again, since we're doing sketches and we're not sending people sketches, it's okay to use these transparency tools because chances are you're going to export this as a JPEG or a PNG or a TIFF anyway, anyway for email purposes. So I go to the transparency tool. I go to uniform, make it pretty light like that, and you can do add, so essentially just created a, a little watermark, and you can kind of adjust the settings depending on the artwork that you're watermarking, but uh, I don't know if I have far saved on here, maybe I can show Yeah, here we go. I'll show you what our sketch template looks like real quick. I'll pull it up. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a power clip. I'll show that here in a second. Um, yeah, because I think I've pretty much covered everything with the logo, so we've kind of moved into question uh, time anyway. So that, that that's okay. That worked kind of naturally. But uh, this is kind of our sketch templates that we use. Um, you can I don't know if you can see it very well on the screen, but uh, it's got a watermark on here. Now what I do is instead of using white or black, we just keep ours to gray, uh, and then we've got it set to let me see here. I might need to go in here. We've got set at like 73% transparency. And, you know, instead of the square, I've created this kind of, in fact, I, I, I kind of stole this idea from somebody else. I saw they did this kind of cool puzzle piece uh, design. But, you know, not only does it have our logo, it also has the copyright date on there. Um, and we put it over all of our sketches. And by using gray, uh, you know, if you've got an image that has lights and darks on it, then it's going to, you know, add that uh, watermark over the lights and the darks at the same time. Um, but, you know, then we've got, uh, you know, I like to kind of use color to kind of, it gets a little hectic with all the paperwork at our shop. Um, ben and I have been trying to do some uh, classes on, or seminars here too, and, and we've been looking at the organization and the timekeeping stuff, but uh, we've got so much paperwork at our shop, we like to use color to kind of help uh, find projects quickly. You know, it's just sort of a nice way to, uh, I remember that was on a red sketch, so I look for the red sketches right away. But so we've, you know, we use colors um, on all of our different sketches. And uh, 
these are our work orders, same sort of deal. And um, but you can see, you know, we've got uh, we've got the disclaimers on here, um, talking about you know the sketch remains the property of the designer. Uh, you know, there's a 50% deposit on all orders over $300, and it just kind of uh, explains all the the um, the stuff that kind of protects us now. You may want to also add a signature line on your sketches. Now we've got it on our sketches. We have it on our um, uh, uh, our invoices. All sorts of. Um, um, I think I'm having a brain fart. I can't can't think of the yeah our quotes things like that. So you know we want our customers to sign off on that stuff. So that if if there ever is a, a a disagreement on what they agreed to, we can say, well, here's the paperwork. Here's where you agreed to our terms. Here's where you agreed to this design. Here's where you approved on. Um, you know, we we stuck to what we said we were going to do. You signed off on it. And um, a lot of times in, in our little small community, that's not a huge problem. Um, but as the years have been going on, it, it it's becoming more of a problem even in uh, little Pontiac, Illinois. So um, that's that. Now I was going to show uh, the power clip. I'll do that real quick. All right, so let's say we get this lettering here, and now here again, I'm adding pictures, so um, obviously now we've ventured into print design. We're not really going to be able to produce this in vinyl or screen print this or anything, but. Um, to do this, uh, you want to select the shape that you want inside this lettering. You want to go to Effects. You want to select Power Clip, Place Inside Container, and then you want to click on that shape that you want. Now, um, right now it's not showing that we did anything. That's because the image is still down here. If we moved it up here, and we did Effects, Power Clip, now it's within that. But let's go back to what I did the first time. Effects, power clip, place inside container. All right. Now, if you hold down your control key and you select that image, you go inside the power clip. So everything else on the screen is now gone. We are now just focusing on the inside of this shape. And what we can do is we can add vector, um, bitmaps, Let's say we want to give this kind of a glossy reflection. I create a white square. I use my transparency tool. Something like that. And then when you're done, you simply select Finish Editing Object. And what we've done is we've created that. And so I do a lot of kind of nice little lettering treatment uh, on some of my lettering when it's going to be something that's printed and I use power clip all the time. Here we'll take a we'll just take a black shape here. I'm going to trim this out. Now what I'm going to do is create a drop shadow effect here. We'll make it really strong. Adjust the settings the way we want it. And so now what we've done is we've kind of made it look like it's dropping back a little bit there. So that's kind of the fun things you can do with Power Clip. It's a tool I use all the time. Uh, one of my favorite features. Um, but uh, is, is that kind of what you were asking? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I was Okay. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. How do you do multi-copies or arrays? Like... Um, it's real easy and flexible. You can step, you can step and repeat, whatever. I haven't been able to figure out how to do that. I just started working with what I'll draw. Step and repeat. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Um, what I do with that is I, I create, like, let's say we want to keep, uh, let's do a shape like this here. Let's say I want to just kind of create a row of this. Is that what you're talking about? Okay. This is real easy. Simply select the tool, hit Control D, which is duplicate. 
then move it wherever you want. Then hit Control D again, and it just repeats the last thing you did. But you can't give it specific distances. You have to kind of measure it if you can. When you do, is there is there a dialog box in Control D? Yeah. Well, by default, you can you can change that uh, duplicate setting. Okay. Uh, you can see right here it is 0.25. So it either it either copies the last duplicate you did. So in this case, I went all the way out here, and now I created that same step. There's a step I'm looking for. A range, I think, and step I'm not sure it's label up there, but it's, it's, I use it all the time. I'm not seeing it. You can also set the duplicate settings through the tools and options. Yeah, it's in there, but it's also right here. It's really easy to get to. Um, you can change it, you know, if you want it to go over X amount. Uh, two inches, and then in Y amount 0.5 inches. Um, now the first duplicate I do, it's going to do that. I found that the person I was taken over from when he was duplicating objects for decals, you know, a bunch of them. <laughs> like every he dilt two, then he take the two and do two four, and it was like, wait a minute. Like, you can do this in like three seconds. Yeah. Uh, up and over and, you know. Well, a lot of times it's just kind of the, a lot of these software, they have really easy way of doing these things because they've, they've thought of these things. It's just a matter of finding it. Here's another really cool way to use the, the duplicate feature. Um, I'm going to convert this to curve. I'm just going to create this shape like this. Now, not only does the duplicate remember the last distance that you did, but it, it also can remember the last rotation that you did. So I'm going to hit Control. I'm going to move this down here. Now I'll hit Duplicate, and it's going to repeat that. And I created a real quick uh, pinwheel effect here. Um, another easy way to do something kind of similar to that is I love the Polygon tool. It's very powerful. Um, one design I did, uh, I just got through winning a contest doing a design that had a lot of gears in it. And so to do that, to do gears, what I did was I, I did, let's say, 30 points here. Now, the, what the polygon tool is, it you can work on one, uh, one line segment, and it repeats it on all the other uh, adjacent line segments. So basically what I've done is... Created, and you can get real funky with it. I mean, they don't have to be, you know, now it's starting to look a little bit more like a saw blade. And the really cool thing about it is now that I've done that, let's say I've got, you know, so I've got 30 of these repeating around. I can up it up to 60 if I wanted just by changing that. The star tool does the exact same thing. So right now it's five. Um... I can actually go in here and adjust this. Uh, the problem with the star tool is it's it's uh, it's kind of locked in place. That's why I like to use the polygon tool more. You can even use the polygon tool to make stars, um, but you can uh, you know adjust the number of points pretty easily. There's a an, another star tool uh, that does the complex star, and essentially it just pulls the lines all the way through. But, uh, yeah, that's uh, another feature I really like to use. Okay, uh, any other questions? On the transparency tool, it looks like it disappeared. How do you get that to come back up? Oh, okay, so uh, whenever you're dealing with the transparency tool, and the transparency tool, the cool thing about it is, uh, I'll bring that photo back in here. It works on bitmaps, too. To get to the transparency tool, um, you select down here. This, what this says is this has your contour tool, uh, it has the blend tool, the distort tool. Um, some of these features, like the distort tool, I, I might show you tomorrow uh, in the where I kind of take the logo into the the branding part of it. Um, we've got some really cool 3D effects that you can do too. Uh, 
all those tools are in here too. Um, but the transparency tool is in here too. And to do that, you just click on this, whatever tool you last use in this group of tools, um, transparency is at the bottom. Now the other thing you could do is if it's transparency is a tool that you use a lot, you can uh, actually um, yeah, that's the uh, the extrude tool. Um, it's right here. Now the extrude tool. I'll show you that real quick because that's that's a fun tool. You can do it to lettering too. This is actually my favorite part of doing these because I like to just play around on this and show people the things that you can do in Corel. But um, so you can take this. give it let me give it an outline here so we can see what's going on so we've created a you know a lot of a lot of software design software has a similar tool but the really cool thing is if you click on it again you get this additional rotate op uh, option and you can actually start doing some 3d stuff with it and we talked a little bit about bevels uh, you can actually give your extrude a bevel too you can even go in and light it. So a lot of kind of cool things with that. And the cool thing about this is this is all vector at this point. Um, yeah, I can I can change the lighting. Uh, you can you can attempt to go in and edit the text. I don't think you can once you've added this amount of effects to it, but. Uh, a lot of times when you apply effects to, to lettering, you can still go in and, and edit the text and change what the text says. I don't think we're able to do that at this point because we've done too much to it. Yeah. But um, that's kind of a, a cool feature. But back to this uh, transparency question. Um, to get to that, yeah, you simply go down here. And I wanted to show you that you can do transparencies on bitmaps too. Um, you can do fills and transparencies on the same. I know that's difficult on some software. So if we do like a black to blue uh, gradient, and then we can do a different um, interactive transparency that kind of uh, does its own thing. Um, this is kind of a cool... Uh, feature too. When you actually go in there, you can do radial transparencies, where you can adjust that. You can uh, do it the opposite way here. You can do uh, just your basic uniform, and you can adjust the how transparent or opaque it is. Um, Square, you can do cones. Um, <clears throat> you can add the preset Corel textures. I don't do that very often, but you know, there's some kind of cool stuff in there. Um, but the cool thing is, once you have a transparency, these settings here uh, allow you to, let's say, Add or see we're on black right now, so let's move it over here. Oops. Okay, so we're gonna we can do add, we can do subtract, we can do multiply. Uh, if lighter, which is kind of cool because essentially if the colors are lighter than the background, they're gonna show up. If they're darker, then they disappear completely. And so depending on how you adjust the setting. Uh, it can do that. And if darker, obviously, is the complete opposite of that. So this is kind of a cool feature. Uh, texturize, what that does is essentially makes the image a black and white image. And so if you want to, if you have a wood grain and you want to, and in the wood grain photo that you're using is brown and you want to put it over a green uh, shape, you can use texturize and you can get that wood grain 
uh, effect to the green shape without it mixing the brown in there with it. Um, all sorts of really cool things in here to kind of mess around with the, uh, you know, if you're real into the process printing, these are kind of cool features where it just... Yeah, I, yeah, you can you can actually pull in. Uh, uh, you can actually, yeah. Here you go. You can actually create your own textures. Um, you can create. Uh, you can adjust your tiling in here. To be honest with you, I don't mess too much with these. Uh, I prefer to uh, bring in my own textures, and and to do that, uh, you can either take your own photos, obviously, or um, you can go to let's say stock photo websites and, and, and buy those images. I really recommend you not just go online and grab the first image you find because that could you could get in trouble doing that. I mean th those those images are copyrighted for a reason. So look at uh, we use iStock Photo a lot for you know textures and and images that w that we might need for for that type of thing. Um, but pay close attention to the the rights that you're agreeing to when you get those images because there's different levels of, of usage for those uh, stock images. Um, you know, a lot of times for the texture stuff, it's pretty cut and dry. I mean, you buy it and you can use it for your, your project. But, you know, there's limits on how many times you can use it for different projects or how many projects can use it. So um, I definitely recommend, you know, do the right thing. You know, just don't grab any image off of uh, Google Images. Um, take advantage of... I know you have to pay for the image, but that's that's the way you're supposed to do it. Uh, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all. Um, I had a lot of fun. And uh, if you have any if you have any questions uh, or if you wanted to get on that list, just uh, stop by and um, they might kick me out of here pretty soon. So I'll be out in the the hallway for a little while too but uh, I can get all your information and then send you an email when these videos will be online if you wanted to kind of come back and look at some of this stuff so thank you